this. Oh, there it is. Okay, so let's start again. My name is Michelle Early, and I am the owner and instructor of Magnolia School of Real Estate here in Southwest Florida. So you came to study for the state exam today. So let's get right into that studying for the state exam. So what I would recommend, so we're going to go over 25 questions. And these 25 questions, I will tell you in my experience, you're going to have between 20 and 25 of them on the state exam, probably closer to 25 than 20. And some of them are going to be exact. And you say, well, can't you get in trouble? Those are exact. Well, how many ways can you ask someone what's the definition of leverage or what is the um, rights to water flowing through your property? Sometimes these, these questions are just exact because this is just what it is. When you're looking at more like a joint tenancy or lead-based paint, those questions are not gonna be in here today because they're more of a lengthy explanation. These are 25 points that you can pick up that are the 25 most asked questions. I have 50 of them, but we put it to the 25 so we can just pick up a bunch of points here. So what I would do is I would get a piece of paper. I'm recording it, so I'm gonna email it to every single person. So what I would do is just get a piece of paper. And as I put up number one, Ask yourself, you know, answer the question and see if you get the right answer. And every time you miss one, just make a tally mark on your paper. These are worth four points each. So at the end, you could easily see what your score would be if this was the state exam. So um, let's do that so that you're not taking a whole bunch of notes. Um, that, that's how I would do it. So let's just start. Let's go. Question number one. Let's do that. So I'm going to let you read it. And then I'm going to show you the answer, and then we're going to talk about it. And before I check it, I just want to check this chat to make sure everybody's still good. Static is getting worse. I cannot hear. It's cutting out for me now too. Oh dear. I tell you what, we got big. Dear, I tell you what, we got big important. We got big important things to do. We can't be messy. We got big, with. big important things to do. We can't be messy. We can't be messing with technical issues. Okay. I'm just going to keep going. And if it gets worse, I'll just continue to monitor the chat. So how is the binder deposit shown in the closing disclosure? And the answer is going to be C, credit to the buyer, credit to the buyer. This question is pretty much, in my experience, going to be exactly worded just like this. And again, how many ways can they ask it? So if it was me, I would get a flashcard and I would write, how is the binder deposit noted on the closing disclosure? I would flip it over and I would write credit to buyer. Sometimes they write credit to buyer only. And so again, this is 100% on your state exam. And if you've already taken the test, then this is, you say, yep, I've had that. And this is the correct answer. Um, so we're not gonna get into like the explanation of that because that's a flashcard. If you go into the state exam and you see binder and you can't say credit buyer, you just haven't studied enough. So make you a good flashcard, pick up that easy point. Let me just check this chat to see how people are doing with the, I just see you, not the question. Audio is good. Can you guys not see this question? It looks like most people are, everything is perfect. That's what I need to hear right now. That's what we want, clear for me. All right, let's do it. Can we just start? I think we're trying. Okay, let's go to number two. All right, take your time and then we will look at it together. Okay, and the answer is null and void. The minute you see post license, the answer is null and void. That is just absolutely 100% on every single test and you wanna make a flashcard for that. Sometimes they ask this about this question. It won't say what is the status of your license. It will say 
What if you don't do that post-license course and you wish to continue in real estate? Well, if you wish to continue in real estate and you didn't do your post-course, then your status is null and void. You will need to do all four steps again, fingerprints, application, state exam, and um, the 63-hour course. So again, this is a flashcard. The minute you see post, the answer is null and void. Number three. And the answer is due on sale clause. When you get to the state exam, every single person is going to have a question on mortgage clauses. You're either going to have a question that's the due on sale clause, which is this one, or the acceleration clause. And some tests have both questions, which is what you want because it's a good, easy uh, points that you can pick up. So listen to this is super important. It says, which mortgage clause allows the mortgagee? Now the mortgagee is the lender. So it says, which clause allows the mortgagee the right to demand the outstanding loan balance plus accrued interest in the event that the borrower sells or transfers? Those are your keywords. When you see sells or transfers, that's when you know it's due on sale. So listen to this um, explanation. If I wanted to right now, I could take out my deed, I could sign it, Two witnesses could sign to a test that I signed it of my own free will, and I could hand it to you. The minute you voluntarily accept my deed, you own it. And on the state exam, they're going to want to know, do you have to record it? And the answer is no. Legally, you do not have to record it. So what's going to happen is I hand you my deed. You own my house. Well, the bank is going to say, hello, due on sale. You owe us $250,000. So that's why if I sell my house to you and I have a loan on it and I didn't tell the lender, do on sale immediately. So when you see mortgage clause, just tell yourself, okay, is it the due on sale or is it the acceleration? Because due on sale means that the borrower sold or transferred. Acceleration means that the borrower defaulted. And so you would want to remember that as well. So let's look at the next one. Number four. So this is another one of those questions that you're just going to see pretty much exactly like this. I mean, how else can they really ask it? And so when you get to the state exam, you tell yourself, yes, this is the easiest question ever. The answer is always property taxes, always. And if you're that one person out of a million that the answer is not property taxes, then the answer is special assessment. Because listen to this. If I foreclosed, if I got foreclosed on my house right now, let's say I didn't pay my mortgage for five, six, seven months. Well, I'm in default, acceleration clause kicks in and I have to pay all the money that is due. Well, if I didn't pay my mortgage, I probably didn't pay my property taxes. So when the bank takes my house and they auction it, the bank does not pay themselves first. They have to pay superior liens first. And the superior liens are property taxes and then special assessments. And then federal estate tax, but you won't see that. You probably won't even see special assessment. 99.9% .9 of the time, this is the exact question. And the answer is always property taxes because it's the superior lien. So pick that easy, easy point up and just make a flashcard. Nope, dates don't matter. Oh, and listen to this too. Any questions that you have, put it in the chat. And then I'm gonna send out a mass email with the questions and answers. But also at the end of this, I'm going to go through and answer those questions. So I have uh, blocked off a good three hours to be here. Obviously, you don't have to stay for three hours. But if your commitment is like, yes, let's talk about the state for three hours, I'm here and ready to do that. So let's go on to the next one. When you see this question, pick property taxes, because if it is in the answer, it is the answer 100% of the time. Okay, 
Number five, take your time with this one. Oops, there's the answer. <laughs> so this question is super important. Listen to why this question is so important. You're going to have three questions on FHA and VA. So I want to take just a couple of minutes and tell you all about FHA and VA so that you can pick up three points. Three points is huge. So the first thing is this question wants to know which of the following is incorrect concerning FHA and VA. Anytime a question wants to know what's incorrect, what I would recommend doing is finding three things that are true so that you can remove those. Um, and when you're eliminating and then you're just left with the thing that's false. So listen to this very important um, um, explanation of the difference between an FHA loan and a VA loan. Cause again, it's so many points. When I bought a house five years ago, I had saved money for the down payment and the, um, the mortgage lender said, do you want to put down 3.5% or 20%. And I said, well, of course, 3.5%. Never asked why. And so they, he said, well, you're going to get an FHA loan. And I thought, okay, great. I love that bank, FHA. I didn't know that FHA wasn't a bank. So what I saw on my coupon book, it says that um, you, I, I had a loan through Everbank. And I said, well, that's odd. Well, now, of course, I understand that FHA is a government insured loan because you see no lender is going to loan me $250,000 if I only put down 3.5% and I don't have an insurance policy to take care of that other 16.5% if I default. So it makes perfect sense. It's a great idea. The lender still gives me a loan because now FHA charges me an upfront fee and monthly to insure that other 16.5%. So 100% on the state exam, you're going to see a question that you have to know that FHA is a government insured loan. And I would make a flashcard for that because it is an insured loan. And they even have another question on the state exam that says, which of the following is most like an insurance company? You say, oh, insurance company, that's the FHA because that's what they do. They insure the other 16.5%. Now, the VA is a government guaranteed loan. And that means that if the veteran defaults, even though they stu still have to pay back um, the loan, the lender is, um, they, they don't have the risk. So 100% on the state exam, you need to know that the FHA is a government insured loan. And the VA is a government guaranteed loan, 100%. Another thing that a lot of people see is that the VA requires a funding fee. So both loans come with an origination fee, but the VA additionally has another fee called a funding fee. And everybody seems to see that question too. Another very popular new question that's out there is this. Imagine that, um, actually I'm a veteran, but let's just pretend my husband was a veteran and my husband, because I wanted him to die in the story, not me. So imagine that my husband is a veteran and we're married and um, obviously we can get a VA loan. Now here's the question on the state exam. If my husband dies, can I still get a VA loan? And the answer is yes, unless I remarry. So a lot of people are seeing that question. You would say, well, her husband died and she's not remarried. Yes, she can get a VA loan. Or her husband died and she's, she is remarried. No, now I, I don't have that benefit anymore. So if you look at this question, A says FHA and VA mortgages are either government insured or government guaranteed, and they're assumable. And that's true. Those are the only two loans that are assumable. Um, FHA is a government insured loan. True. VA is a government guaranteed loan and is accompanied by a funding fee. True. So let's see why D is not true. VA is a government insured. Oh, stop. What is No. VA is a government insured loan. No, 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 no. VA is a government guaranteed loan. So 100%, you're going to see three questions regarding that topic there. So what I've done after every five questions is I've made another slide 
that is going to be information for you that's going to help you pass the state exam because that's what you're here for today. Now, if for some reason you are this far along that you are in this stage of, of, of getting your real estate license and you don't know about this candidate information booklet for the real estate sales associate exam, well, it is the absolute most important document that you can have. All you have to do is Google it. It'll pop right up. It's a PDF. It's from myfloridalicense.com, which is the DBPR, the company or the agency that's licensing you for real estate. They don't just make a test and say, good luck. They have to put on this website every single test that they give, um, what's on it. And that's what this booklet does. So it starts on page four and it's called content overview and outline. I used it as a checklist for my sales test. And then there's another one for the instructor's exam. I used that one as a checklist. And I passed the, the first time, not because I'm so smart, but because I had a checklist of everything on the state exam. And so listen to this. this if you don't know this, this is crazy. It actually even tells you how many points come from every single chapter of your text. So for instance, chapter one only has one question. Doesn't matter how many times you take the state exam, chapter one only has one question. Chapter two has six, chapter three has two, chapter four has seven. Chapters five and 11 have 12 points each. And then chapters 12 and 13 together have 13 points. So you say, well, oh my gosh, that's the most important information possible, except for the other most important information, which is actually what are the topics? So if you haven't already printed that and you're using it as a checklist, that's how you know when you're ready. Every single topic that they're going to ask you, you check it. And those topics will follow your text no matter which course you took, even if it was online. Most important document right there. Most important. All right, number six. I'll probably say this 100 more times or at least 20 more times, but in my experience, it's 100% that you're going to see this question. Every one of these 25, the same thing. So I'll try to stop saying it, but that is the answer there. And this is just a flashcard. There's just no need to even explain it. If someone said to you penalty and you heard the word first time minor violation, notice of noncompliance. It's just like a ticket. It's like a warning ticket that the DBPR investigators issue for something that's small. So again, this is a flashcard. Pick up that easy point. Number seven. The answer, breach of trust. So listen to this because it's 100% gonna be on the state exam. I said I was gonna stop saying it um, because you just don't know, it, you're gonna get one question or the other. You're not sure which, so we have to know both. So listen to this. When me as a sales associate, when I list a house, I don't really list it. Even though my name is on there and my sign is in the yard and I did all the work and I found the customer, my broker is actually the one who legally has listed that house. So imagine that I get mad at my broker or I'm moving or whatever, but I decide I, I'm leaving. Maybe I'm going to a different brokerage. And what I do is I go into my boss's office, my broker, and I take Original, start with originals. I take original listing documents with original signatures and I steal it. When you see that question in the state exam that says, what is my penalty? That is called larceny, C-A, because it's originals is larceny. Now, if I'm smart enough to know not to take originals and what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna copy them or duplicate them, make copies, then the question is, what is my penalty for stealing copies? And the answer is breach of trust. And the funny part is the books, most books don't even have it worded like that, but this is how you're going to see it. So if you saw a question that said you took original listings, what would be the answer? A, larceny. Now, what if you took duplicates or copies? Breach of trust. And I would make two flashcards because that's going to be one point on the state exam. Let me just check this chat to see. 
Can you repeat the chapters and numbers? Can you repeat the chapters and number of questions? Um, so it's gonna, everything's recorded. Um, I'm recording this, so you'll be able to see everything again. What I would like to do is start telling you which one each of these chapters come from. Um, so this is gonna be chapter three and six, actually, depending on which book you have. Okay, number eight. This comes from chapter nine, and the answer is covenant of season. Most of the time on the state exam, they just call it season. And sometimes it's spelled S-E-I-Z-I-N. Um, this is a flashcard because all it is is a sentence in the deed. If I was selling you my house and I was holding my deed, there would be a sentence in there that says that I have season or, you know, the covenant of season. Sometimes it says, which means that I legally can sell you my house. But again, I wouldn't even take it that far. This is a flashcard. If you saw something that said clauses or covenants in a deed, and it said anything about owning it and the right to sell it, flashcard, season, season, 100%, you're gonna see it, chapter nine. This comes from chapter 18. There's three questions on chapter 18. This is definitely one of them. Ad valorem taxes, that's another one that's coming from that chapter. And then definitely homestead mills. A little bit of math from there, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's look at this one. Property taxes and mortgage interest. Don't get caught up in these mortgage payments. Your, your mortgage payments aren't deductible. We wish, right? Nope, not the mortgage payments just the mortgage interest and property taxes. And again, 100%, I have to keep saying it because it's just so important to know this is a flashcard and you just have to know when it says I own a house, what can I deduct on my income taxes, property taxes, mortgage interest. Let me just check this chat, make sure everybody's okay. Please stop typing the answer. She's not reading. Oh, are you guys arguing? <laughs> Can't wait to read the chat stuff later. How fun, okay. That wasn't to me, was it? I don't know. Okay, let's just go. <laughs> Number 10. Go. Uh, there we go. Okay. Number 10. The minute you see method of pro surveying property and the word subdivision, you are looking for lot and block. And I know I keep saying it, but a lot of people, especially when we're adults, we kind of we're like, how do I study? Should I read? Should I take practice tests? I would do all of those things, but I would also make flashcards because it's just such an effective way to remember a lot of, you know, really boring, useless, really information. Um, so um, again, when it says surveying property, and you see the word subdivision or the word plat maps, any of that, lot and lock, lot and lock. Go in there and just be have that point locked down because it's 100%, you're going to see it. Okay, so after this one, so this is our next tip. We got to slide, uh, um, slide question 10. We're going to just quickly talk about scheduling your state exam. So good thing this is recorded because if you haven't scheduled, a lot of you have, but a lot of you have not scheduled it. This is a breakdown of exactly how to schedule your state exam because it used to be a lot easier. You just go in, hit schedule. Well, now you have to make a decision when you get there and it's not really that clear um, what those decisions are because your decision now is, do I take it at home or do I take it in the testing center? So let's talk about pros and cons of both. So if you take the test at home, it's your comfortable environment, it's your computer. You don't have to wear a mask. Um, those are pretty much, oh, you can probably get a date quicker. Those are pretty much the only pros. Listen to the cons of taking it at home, which the pass rate's the same for both. So, you know, do whatever feels right for you. It's a personal choice. But if you take the test at home, you cannot get up. And I mean, you cannot get up for the entire, you know, however long it takes you to take it. You've got three and a half hours. 
if you have to pee or you have to, your dog is barking or something like that, or kids come in and start talking to you. Um, so the, they will pull the plug on you if you're taking it at home and you get out of your seat. Plus, I've had so many students that even the day before they make you run this diagnostic test on your computer and then now it's time to start and here you are, you're finally ready to take the state exam that you studied and studied and you can't get on. And it's just really frustrating. People call me and they're, they're crying and they say, I can't get on. My computer has an app that's open or something like that. So also you can't write anything down if you take it at home. You have to write on the computer and you have to use the calculator on the computer. So definitely some negatives to taking it at home. I will tell you, I can't tell you hundreds of people that told me I loved taking it at home because it was my own personal space and I didn't have any issues with that. So definitely keep it a personal choice. If you take it in the testing center, you're going to be able to write on a nice board. It's got like six pages front and back. It's got a nice marker. Um, you're going to be able to bring your own calculator, nothing fancy. They won't let you bring anything that um, stores any kind of, um, you know, formulas. And then um, also uh, uh, you will have to wear a mask if you do take it in the testing center. But here's the biggest thing of all for me personally. If you're in the testing center and you're at question, let's say 50, and you find your mind kind of wondering. I remember I was looking at people's shoes and your mind starts to wonder. That's when you raise your hand and you say, I need to take a break. Walk right out, put some water on your face and go back in because you don't want a 73 like some people said they had or a 74 because your mind got tired. So you can always take breaks in the testing center. But here's how to actually schedule your state exam. There's gonna be two blue links at one point, And it tells you here that the top blue link is to take it in the testing center. And the bottom blue link is to take it at, at home. Um, and it's your option. So let's keep moving forward and look at the next question. Number 11. I'm just gonna check this real quick. I'm going to say it because I have to. This is 100% that you're going to see this on the state exam. And it says, which of the following types of notice is also called legal notice and is achieved by recording documents in the public records, constructive notice. And this one doesn't stick because it's not named well. So make sure you make a, um, make sure you make a slide, or a slide, make sure you make a flashcard for that. So listen to this really quickly. Remember when I told you I could take my deed out, I could sign it and I could hand it to you. And when I handed it to you and you voluntarily accepted it, you owned my house. Well, did you have to record the deed? No, and you're going to see that on the state exam. You do not legally have to record it. Now, would you want to record it? Absolutely, because you need to let the whole world know that you own my house. And the way you do that is by recording your deed. What is it called when you record your deed? It's called providing constructive notice. So constructive notice is the act of recording documents in the public records. Most of the time for our purposes, it's a deed because that's what we're talking about is a transfer of land. So I know I keep saying it, but it's just because it's so important, make a flashcard. If you see what kind of notice, oh, constructive notice, constructive notice. Um, real notice and pending notice are not even real things. An actual notice is someone saw you do something. Those are never the answers. It's always constructive notice. Okay, the answer is title theory. Okay, so every single person that takes the state exam either has a question where the answer is title theory or lien theory. Bank theory and loan theory are made up. Every single person will have one or the other. So listen to this. We live in Florida. And if you think about Florida, Florida, Florida is, let's see if you can see here. Florida is a long and lean state. So that's my Florida. It's a long and lean state because Florida is a lean theory state. And that's how I remembered it to begin with. You say, well, what does that even mean? Florida is a lean theory state. So remember I told you five years ago, I bought my house. Well, I borrowed, you know, $230,000, $240,000. And when I got to the closing table, they handed me my deed. And I said, well, that's kind of nice. Um, I, I owe a whole bunch of money on this house. 
but yet I own it during the loan period. So if this question would have said, in which of the following mortgage lending theories does the borrower retain title? Title means ownership. If it would have said which of them does, well, that would be lien theory because I get my title. It's the deed. The title is the deed. That's how I prove it. And so um, it's not a piece of paper, a title. It's a theory. How do I prove that I have title? I show you my deed. And because I live in a lien theory state, I got that the day I bought the house. Now, if you move to California, they are a title theory state. And listen to this. This is crazy when compared to here anyway. When you move to California and you buy a house and you borrow, you know, $250,000, they're going to show you your deed and they're going to say, don't touch it. Don't touch your deed. When you pay this off in 30 years, we'll mail it to you because in a title theory state, the borrower does not retain ownership during the loan period. You're like a renter and it's just like a car. When you pay off the title or when you pay off the car, you get the title. Same thing in a title theory state. So see this question coming a mile away. You say, oh, this is the, it's title theory or lien theory. Let's see if the borrower does or does not retain ownership during the loan period. So if it says the borrower does not, oh, that's title theory. If it says the borrower does, that's where we live. That's lien theory. 100% you're going to see that. This is a crazy little question. So this question is a little bit silly, but it is on every state exam. And the answer is East. So what you're looking at here is the meets and bounds um, method of describing property. And it goes all on degrees. So never eat soggy waffles. This is 90 degrees. 180 degrees. I don't know why I'm talking so fast. I'm going to try to calm down. 270 degrees. 360 degrees. When you see this question, first off, the answer is always east. So just put east. But to understand it, it says you're headed north at 90 degrees east. When you're using a compass, you never look at the north, the east, the south, the west. It doesn't matter. You only look at the number or the degrees. And 90 degrees is due east. So when you see this question, which you are sure to see, you would say, oh, 90 degrees, that's east. That's east. Let's just check the chat, make sure. So lean theory, you have the deed during the loan period. Yeah, lean theory, you have the deed during the loan period. I'm gonna answer all of those questions um, at the end. We'll go through and look at each one. So let's go to number 14. How are you doing? I know you can't really answer me, but I hope you're like, oh, 13, I got all 13 right. And if not, now you have some good material to study. Okay, 100%, you'll see this one. Oh, I keep forgetting the chapters. This is 17. And the answer is gonna be B. So listen to this, leverage, leverage. Leverage is what smart people do. It's what rich people do. This is what they do. They borrow other people's money so they can make money with it. So think about like Tark and Christina. They're always borrowing other people's money. So listen, I love that show. So listen to this. Imagine that you bought an ice cream shop. So you're an investor and you bought an ice cream shop. And the ice cream shop makes $2,000 profit every single month. But what you did was you didn't use your own money to buy it. You went and got a loan and you used the bank's money to buy it. Well, let's pretend your loan costs $1,000. So every month you go to the ice cream shop, you pick up $2,000, $1,000 in your pocket, $1,000 to the bank, and you never used your own money. It's called leverage. And it's, it's, it's always on the state exam. It's from chapter 17. And leverage is the use of borrowed funds. Now, sometimes they try to get tricky and talk about positive versus negative leverage. Remember when I told you the ice cream shop makes $2,000 and it only cost me $1,000 to borrow the money? That is positive leverage. But imagine it was the other way around. Oh, that's not what you want. It costs $2,000 to borrow the money and you only make $1,000. That is negative leverage. So 
leverage can be positive or negative, but 95, probably percent of the time in the state exam, they want to know that it's borrowed funds to purchase or finance an investment. Okay, number 15. Let me just look real quickly. What is number two? My computer crashed. Oh. Okay, we'll look at all of that when we go. Let's look at the next one. I mean, take your time, four points on the state exam here. Okay, probably a lot of people put D, say, well, we can't do appraisals. And if you did that, you, you probably gave the um, state some really good two or three points because the answer is actually B, that the licensee is subject to the FREC discipline, which is the Florida Real Estate Commission, which is those seven people um, that kind of are our bosses, if you will. So listen to this because we have to spend two or three or even four minutes on this because you're gonna pick up four state exam points right here. And this is gonna be from chapter 16, appraisal. So listen to this crazy thing that you may already know, but you may not know. As a licensed real estate sales associate, so the court, you know, the, the um, license that you're getting, you are legally allowed to do appraisals. And you say, wait a second, I'm not an appraiser. Well, of course not. But an appraisal is a service of real estate and you are a real estate agent and you can perform any service of real estate. So listen to this because it's super important and you're going to see it on the state exam. Number one, you're going to see this question, possibly. Can you call yourself an appraiser? Well, no, you're not an appraiser. You didn't take that class, um, but yet I can do appraisals. Say, well, why is that's tricky? Of course it's tricky. It's the state exam. It's the sixth hardest test in the country. Failed 25,000 people last year. It's a really tricky question or tricky uh, test. So listen to it all the way through. If I asked you as a sales associate, can you legally perform appraisals? You would say, yes, I can. But listen to this big exception. You cannot do an appraisal if the money is federally related. And what that means is there's a loan involved. So if someone called you and said, hey, can you do the appraisal on this house? I'm buying it cash. Yes, you can legally do that appraisal. Hey, I'm buying a house. Can you do me? I'm buying it for cash. Can I pay you to do the appraisal? Absolutely. Now, remember, all money flows through your broker, um, but you can charge for that. You can charge a fee, never a commission. So the question on the state exam is, can you do appraisals? Yes. Can you do an appraisal if the money is federally related? No. So if somebody called you and said, hey, can you do an appraisal on getting a loan? Nope, you're out. You can't do it. You can't do it. FHA loan, conventional loan, VA loan, you can't do it. So the next thing on the state exam is if you, because you're a sales associate, if you're allowed to do appraisals, um, can you do it any way you want? Can you just get out a piece of paper and start making an appraisal? And the answer is no, you have to do it just like an appraiser does it. You have to develop it and report it just like an appraiser would. And you say, well, how would I do that? Well, you would follow appraiser rules. What are those called? Use path. So here's the use path right here. So the thing is, the question on the state exam, most of the time, one of the four of, of this topic is, what does the use PAP stand for? Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. So make a flashcard. If you don't, if you can't say that, again, you just haven't studied enough. Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice because they're going to give you a question and ask you, you know, which of these is use PAP. So if somebody said to you, well, use PAP, that sounds fancy. What is that? You would say, oh, no, no, that's just rules that appraisers follow. And then the next question, would a sales associate ever have to follow use PAP? Well, of course, if you were doing an appraisal, because you're allowed to do an appraisal. Can you call yourself an appraiser? No. 
And can you do it any way you want? No, because we know you have to follow the use path if you are. So that is right there, two or three points. And then the other um, one or you know, two or three points is gonna come about a CMA, which is a comparative market analysis still from chapter 16. And that is gonna come with a range of values. So if my neighbor called me and said, hey, can you come sell my house? What I hear is, hey, can you come list my house in the MLS, put your side in the yard and make a paycheck? Yep, I'll be right over. So what I'm gonna do before I get there, I'm gonna do a quick CMA. And that CMA is gonna tell my neighbor, your house is worth between 300 and 320,000. So see how it's different than an appraisal? So the question on the state exam is this always, can we as sales associates call a CMA an appraisal? You say, well, no, that's ridiculous. An appraisal is one thing and a CMA is a completely different thing. So you're definitely gonna see that, that you cannot call, you can't hand someone a CMA and say, here's your appraisal. Nope, it's not, it's a comparative market analysis. So keep them separate in your mind. And then the next thing is about a BPO. It's a broker's price opinion. So you wanna think about your broker as the head of an octopus and you as all uh, us as sales associates, we are all the legs or arms, legs, I think would be it. So um, we're one unit. So the question on the state exam wants to know a broker's price opinion. Well, that sounds like something only a broker could do. Nope, we can do those too. And all a broker's price opinion is, it's an opinion of value. We think it's worth this much. And we tell the bank that because maybe they're foreclosing. So you want to look at those three valuation products as three completely different things. An appraisal is an appraisal that is a value that is supported by evidence. It must follow the use path. And we are allowed to do them as long as it's not federally related. A CMA comes with a range of values and can never be called an appraisal. And then a BPO is a written opinion of value. I guarantee you, you're going to see a question that says, which of the following is a written opinion of value? And you say, oh, wait, a written opinion. That's a BPO or a broker's price opinion. So three different things there. That's going to be four points that we just talked about. Here's a little tricky question. Okay, so let me see if I can quiz you and trick you on this question. It's a tricky one. If you were doing a CMA, comparative market analysis, oh, who's writing on that? Is that me? Oh, that's messy. Okay. If you were doing a CMA, a comparative market analysis, um, would you have to follow the use path? So think about that for a minute. If you were doing a comparative market analysis, would you have to follow the use path? And the answer is no. You say, wait a minute, a CMA and a use pat? No, no, no. The only time I follow the use pat, which are appraisal rules, is when I'm doing an appraisal. So that is going to be um, four, four points right there. You can do appraisals. Isn't that crazy? Oh, and another thing too, anytime, oh, I'm starting too fast again. Okay. Anytime you see a question and the answer says the licensee is subject to FREC discipline, well, that's always going to be the answer, because if you did something you're not supposed to do, that's who's going to discipline you is going to be the FREC. They're that um, seven party, um, like a division inside of the division of real estate inside of the DBPR. So, OK, let's do it. Number 15. Oh, we're at the next um, tip that's going to help you pass the state exam. So here's where I pitch you my forty nine dollar product, and it is the online cram course. Um, it, and I'm just going to tell you quickly because today we came to study, but this is how I make my living is by helping people pass the state exam. So um, the cram course includes the 50 most asked questions. Today you're seeing 25 of those. I have 50 and it comes with videos explaining every single one and about eight or nine of those videos are the math and it explains the math in detail, the actual math you're going to see on the state exam. It has the 10 most asked math questions after that. 25 questions that are 100% in the state exam. They're worded different than these today because I worded them so tricky that it included the whole topic in one answer. Three 100 question practice tests that are extremely similar to the state exam. One of them is so similar that um, people say they have 70, 80 of those questions. Um, always not the exact question you see, but the, the topics are there. And then you have a link for five additional. So it is $49 so that everyone can afford it because you've already paid so much money to get to this point. Um, but it is, you take it at your own pace and you can just take those tests over and over and watch those videos over and over. So let's go to the next one. I think we are on number 16. No. It's all Florida. Everything we're doing today is Florida. 
no, we're not studying for any other um, any other test but Florida. And when you sign up, we can start it immediately. Okay, this is a funky little question. You say, seriously, this is it? But I'm telling you, if you've already taken the state exam, you say, oh, dear God, I had this stupid question. I, it's just there. I don't know why, but it is. So here's how you go about this question. First off, of course, it's a flashcard. When you see this word rules, when you see the word rules, you say, wait a second, rules? I'm studying laws, especially if I'm taking the mutual test. It's law, 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 475, 120 all these different laws. And you say, what is this rules thing? Well, the thing is the FREC is an administrative agency. Those seven people, they're not legislature. They don't make laws. The FREC makes rules. And so what are those rules called? They're called chapter 61J2. And you just have to memorize that. They're gonna give you different variations like this little mess right up here. So if I, if I said to you the word rules, you'd say, oh, rules, that's FREC, chapter 61J2. And just have that baby memorized so you can just pick up that easy point. Boy, really excited about that one. Some of these are so easy if you just knew what they were gonna ask. Sounds like some stuff's going on. Okay, let's go to the next one. Take your time. So I know this is too quick, but I just want to give you the answer so we can move right on and I can tell you exactly what you need to know. So that is not a true statement. Buyers must have the property inspected. That is not a true statement because they want to know which does not apply. So listen to this 100% question on the state exam and you need to know five things. Um, so at, um, before January 1st, 1978, we used to put lead in the paint. And of course we realized that lead is harmful. So after anything built after January 1st of 1978 is not gonna have lead in the paint legally. So that means that what if you're selling a house that was built before January 1st, 1978? Um, and the question on the state exam is what are sellers and um, keep it sellers, because that's what they say, what are sellers required to do by law because the house was built before January 1st, 1978. So the first question on the state exam that you could see regarding this, or it's gonna be all in one kind of like this is, but what it's gonna to wanna to know is that it is the seller's responsibility to do the four things I'm about to tell you. It is not the sales associate. Now we can assist in that, but since we're learning the law, the law, the law needs to know who is in trouble if it doesn't happen, that's the seller. So be very careful, don't let them think, make you think the sales associates responsible to do the four things I'm about to tell you. Nope, it's the seller. Okay, so if a house is being built, is being sold, it was built before January 1st, 1978, the seller must do four things. The first thing is the seller must disclose if there's lead in the paint. So let's say they know, okay, they have to disclose it. If they don't know, they don't do anything, disclose. The second thing is sellers have to provide buyers with a disclosure, an actual piece of paper that says, hey, there could be lead in the paint and it's dangerous. And buyers have to acknowledge that they've received that. So disclose, disclosure. The third one, sellers must give buyers an EPA prepared pamphlet, again, regarding the dangers of lead-based paint. And the fourth one is the sellers must give buyers 10 days in which to inspect for lead-based paint. Buyers do not have to inspect and sellers do not pay for it. So listen to this again. Sellers have to do four things. Disclose, disclosure, EPA prepared pamphlet, and um, 10 days to inspect. So the reason this one's not true, it says buyers must have the property inspected. Well, if you're going to tear it down, you're not going to inspect it. So that's why that one's incorrect. Four things, definitely going to see it. Okay, read this one. If you've already taken the state exam, you say, yep, that's it, I had it.
All right, so here's your answer. It is gonna be subtract 2,200 from the comparable uh, transaction price. Okay, so listen to this. I wanna explain this to you the way that to me, it just makes perfect sense. Um, it's been a hundred years ago, but I used to be an appraiser for about five years. And this question is just hard. If you had an appraisal in front of you, it would be easy to see what to do. But when you're just thrown at this weird question. So let me show you how an appraiser actually arrives at the value of a house so that, and let me just mute this one more time. Let me show you how an appraiser actually arrives at the value of a home, and then that's going to give you a, a good idea of um, how to answer this question. Okay, so watch this. We're going to pretend that this uh, marker is the subject property, which means it's the property that's being appraised. So this, we're going to pretend this is my house, and this is 2933 Mayflower Terrace. This is my house. Well, I shouldn't do my address, huh? All right, let me give you my bank account number two. <laughs> so, okay, so this is my house. It's the subject. It's the one that I am appraising. So this is the subject, okay. And the appraiser gets a call and says, please go appraise, please go appraise this house, this subject. So what the appraiser does, and he has no value for this, no value. He has no clue if it's worth 100,000 or 500,000 because that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna find out. So there it is, there's the subject. Now, what the he does is he finds three houses in that same neighborhood that sold that are similar to that house, and they, he calls them comparables. So compare, and we're going to pretend that all three of these are right across the street from my, house, from my house, and all three of them just sold. This one is identical to my house, and it sold for 300000 This one, and it has a, and it has a pool, and, and my house has a pool and it sold for 300,000. This house is identical to my house and it sold for 300,000 and it has a pool. And this third comparable is also exactly identical to my house and sold for 300,000 and has a pool. Well, if you're an appraiser, you just got the easiest appraisal assignment of your entire career because you found three comparables that are exact and all three have a pool and all three are exactly like your subject property. So what then would be the value of this house, what do you think? They're identical to these three, and it, and then these all appraised it. <clears throat> these all sold for three hundred thousand. So, what is the value of this house? Three hundred thousand. It's easy. So now look at it again. This house sold for three hundred thousand. It sold for three hundred thousand with a pool. Sold for three hundred thousand with a pool. Sold for three hundred thousand with a pool. My house is identical. But let's say a pool value is 50,000, which it never would be, but let's just say it's 50,000. And my house does not have a pool. So 300,000 with a pool, identical except a pool. How much will this subject appraise for? Hopefully you said 250,000 because you realize that my house is never gonna appraise at what those three houses sold for because my house is not as good. So what you told me is if the comparable is better, you subtract the value from the comparable. And that's exactly what you did. You said, well, that one was 300, 300, 300. This will appraise at 250. And you did that by subtracting 50 from each one of those. So what I'm gonna tell you is when you get to the state exam and you 100% have this question, the first thing you do is you eliminate anything that says subject. How in the world can we add or subtract from the subject value when we don't even have that? I have to add or subtract from these comparable sales prices and that's how I will arrive at a value of my home. So when you get to the state exam, if you put subject property, no matter how the question is worded, you've missed it. You've given them that point. At least give yourself that 50% chance to say it's add or subtract always from the comparable. So look at this question. The subject property is a three bed, two bath. Here it is, three bed, two bath. These comparables or one of these comparables is a three bed, two and one half bath. So you say, well, this owner, me, Michelle, I want my house to appraise at what that house sold for. And you say, I'm sorry, your house is not gonna appraise at that. This house is better. It has a half bath better. So that's why we had to deduct the value from this comparable because your house will never appraise for that high because the comparable is better. So listen to this. If the comparable is better, subtract. If the comp is better, subtract. Now, if it would have been flipped, then we would simply say that the comparable is not better, so we would add. If the subject had four bedrooms and the comparable had three and sold for 300,000, so four bedrooms, three bedrooms, 
we're going to appraise higher than what this sold for. So whatever the value of this comparable is, $300,000, let us add 10000 to that because we have an extra bedroom. So you see how you're always adjusting from the comparable? So again, if the comparable is better, subtract. CBS, if the comp is better, subtract. And you say, well, the comp isn't better. Okay, then add. But always from the comparable price. All right, we lost like eight people on that one. Okay, let's keep going. Maybe because it's just too long. It's good though. If you're ready to study, let's study. Next one. Again, I know it's too quick, but let's just go so I can tell you exactly what you need to know. Okay, listen to this. Imagine that I put down money to buy a house. So I'm buying your house and I put down a binder deposit of let's say $50,000. And um, then the money goes into escrow like we know it does. And then maybe I'm talking to the seller and you know I'm buying their house. And I say, hey, where's that money? And they say, what do you mean? I thought you knew. No, I thought you knew. That's my $50,000. That's her $50,000. We cannot not know where the escrow is being held. Now, if it was being held at the broker, she would say, oh, my broker holds it. I, I'm, I'm at EXP or Preferred Show or Keller Williams, Cobble Banker. My broker's holding it. But if the broker's not holding it and it's a title company or an attorney, all we would have to do as the buyer and seller, we would simply have to pull out our purchase and sales contract because legally, if the money is being held at that title company or attorney's office, the name, address, and phone number of the title company or attorney's office must be on the purchase and sales contract. But on the state exam, they try to make you think it's the email or the wiring instructions or all these other things. And you would say, wait a second, is that question asking me what has to be on the purchase and sales contract regarding the title company that's holding escrow? Oh, that's easy. Name, address, phone number. Name, address, phone number. Make a flashcard because it's going to be worded funky like this. You've seen it, some of you. They just twist this stuff all kinds of ways. Name, address, phone number. Let me just make sure I'm not like losing. Oh, y'all are talking about something else. Okay, next one, number 20. Oh, you're gonna see this one. Okay, kind of quick, but let me give you the answer. It is going to be that. So listen to this. As a real estate agent, you have so many things that you can use, these new tools that you can use to make money. One of the things, you can do appraisals, which is crazy. You can help people buy, sell. I mean, it's amazing the things you're going to be able to do. Another thing that you're able to do, and, and especially in this market, nobody's doing it right now, but you can do this. So whoops. what you can do is you can sell rental lists. So I'm in Sarasota County. So let's pretend that I'm a real estate agent that wants to make a rental list and sell it. And I'm in Sarasota County. So I'm going to get my piece of paper out and I'm going to write down all the things that are for rent in Sarasota County. This one takes cats. This one's available June 1st. And I'm going to make a whole list because let's say somebody that's moving from California, they don't want to have to look around and find everything that's for rent. Wouldn't it be nice just to have a list? So what I do is I'm going to sell this rental list to that person. And let's say it's for $350 is what I'm gonna sell it to that person for. Here's the list. So what you would wanna know for the state exam is any time within 30 days, orally or in writing, any time within 30 days, if that person that I sold the list to wants, their, wants a refund, I have to give them a refund, any time. So you say, well, that's all. Nope. There's a little bit more to it because how much of a refund is what they're going to ask on the state exam? And the answer is this. If they told me that there was a mistake in my list, I have to give them 100% of their money back. 100%. But if they said they didn't like the list, they didn't obtain a rental, they didn't use the list, anything else, then I have to give them back 75%. 
So listen to this, how you go about this on the state exam. 100% you're gonna see it. When you get to the state exam, say, oh, here's my rental question. And you read it. The first thing you're looking for is it within 30 days? Because you wanna put it so clear in your brain that if it's 30 days, 29 days, 28 days, any time in 30 days, you are giving a refund. So just kind of put that in your brain. Doesn't matter, you are giving a refund. If it's day 31 and that was the worst list on the planet, you are not giving a refund. It doesn't matter. It, so you start with the days. Once you say, okay, it's been within 30 days. Once you say that, then you simply ask yourself, is there a mistake? Or is there anything else? And so this question says a broker provided an up-to-date and accurate rental list. I can tell you right now, I'm never giving you 100% back. I don't care. It's up-to-date and accurate. But because you wanted a refund within 30 days, I am going to give you 75% back. And that's the 260-250. So again, when you get to the state exam, ask yourself, is this within 30 days? If the answer is yes, you're giving a refund back. And then look to see, is there a mistake or no? And you're definitely going to see it. Okay, the next one, I'm so excited to share this with you because I have two slides on some quick facts about the state exam. I have been following it now almost for five years. I had a tutoring business before I got my instructor's license and started at a local school. I did not like how the owner cared more about money than, um, you know, actually um, helping people pass the state exam. So that's why I opened this school three years ago, Magnolia, and I'm obsessed with the state exam because every time someone passes, it feels like I pass and I'm going to be a small part of you starting this amazing career in real estate, tiny part, but it's still a part. So if you're going to take the state exam, listen to this stuff about it. So it'll help you. You're like an investigator. You got to learn everything you can about the state exam. Okay. First one, let me read it to you and kind of follow with me. Mortgages are the highest tested topic on the state exam. So I'm not going to read it anymore. I'm just going to tell you, listen to this. Chapter 12 and 13, you have to be very careful with them because chapter 13 looks like it only has four points, but most books put FHA and VA in chapter 13 instead of chapter 12, which is how the state actually has it, but they let it slide because as long as it's mortgages, it doesn't really matter because 12 and 13 are both mortgages. So what you want to do is you do not want to know that chapter 13 only has four points and that chapter, talking too fast, and that chapter 12 only has nine points. You want to look at chapter 12 and 13 as 13 total points. And those 13 points, you also have two questions on chapter 14 about mortgages. That makes mortgages the highest asked topic. And I'm going to tell you, people that fail the state exam, it's usually the points they've given the most, chapter 11, which is contracts, and chapter 12 and 13, which is mortgages. And after that, it's chapter two. So listen to this again. You're gonna wanna know mortgages and contracts like the back of your hand, because that's where they're gonna take the points from you. That is where they're gonna take the points. At the end of this, when everybody gets to see all the questions, I'll just give you a quick recap of everything in my experience that you're gonna see from 11, 12, and 13, because even just some quick stuff, so you can start focusing um, in on those chapters. Okay, chapter 11 takes the most. I see it all the time. Math, number three, there are only five, and right now it's actually five to 13 because they're making this test harder, so they put a little bit more math. So, but I'm gonna tell you, in my experience now, thousands of students, closer to 5,000 than 4,000 probably that I've worked with, you're only gonna have about seven or eight math questions. Now, somebody's getting 13 and somebody's getting five, but most people are gonna have between seven and eight. You're gonna get three commission questions. You're gonna get one divided by divided by question. Uh, I hope, well, I hope you purchase the cram course so I can continue to, to do this job. But I hope that not only when you purchase it that you can see how easy this math can be, you're just memorizing formulas. So it's gonna be that north half, the south half. All you have to do is take 640 and divide by the bottom numbers, it's so easy. So three commission questions, the divided by divided by from chapter 10. You're gonna have one lot paving question. That one's so easy as long as you remember to divide by two at the end. They don't tell it to you in the question, you have to know it. Um, all of these questions are on that cram course with just the video. Some of those videos are 10, 15 minutes long, really explaining one math question. Um, you're gonna have the lots or the bins. That won't make any sense now, but that's what you'll see. Discount points, mills, mortgage interest on an assumed loan. That's their new hot and heavy one because it's so, so hard to do. It's such a tricky little question until you do it a hundred times. They say, well, I can do that in my sleep now. 
Um, and that list of math questions will cover 90 um, to 100% of what you need. So all that weird appraisal math and all that stuff that you see in the text, it's just not on there. That's the math you're gonna see. Um, chapter two has three questions on the status of your license. So let me quiz you something we've already covered. What is the status of your license if you don't do your required 45 hour post license course? What is the status of your license post? Null and void, exactly. Now listen to these other two questions from chapter two. What is the status of your license if your broker dies, resigns, or is otherwise removed from position? That is involuntary and active. And the next one is, if you don't do your 14 hours, so when you first get your license, you're gonna have between 18 and 24 months to do your post-license education. We offer that at Magnolia and it's, oh, I've got it streamlined, it's, it's, it's easy. But well, it's not easy, it's easier than most courses. But anyway, um, so you have between 18 and 24 months to do your um, post-license at 45 hours. After that, every two years is only 14 hours. So the question on the state exam is, what if you don't do those 14 hours? What is the status? And the answer is involuntary and active. So you're gonna see all three of those, uh, post, null and void. Broker dies or resigns, involuntary and active. I didn't do my 14 hours, involuntary and active. Another thing you're gonna see too is that if your license is inactive, meaning you haven't hung it with a broker, you still have to do continuing education. And you're gonna see that from chapter two as well. All right, let's keep going. I have a couple more of these. The state exam will be easier if you have a textbook and even easier if you have the best textbook. The, te the best textbook is Linda Crawford's Principles, Practices, and Law. If you don't have that and you're serious about making this test as easy as possible, I would hop right onto Amazon and order it. They're up to the 45th edition. Um, well, next one, there's actually 103 questions, but you're only graded on 100. Some people, at, some people at the testing center are telling people, oh, don't worry about the last three. Oh, can you imagine you just gave three points because the, they're trying to widen their bank of questions and those three questions that you think, oh, these last three don't count, they do because the ones that are the fake ones that you're not graded on, that they're widening their bank with, they're mixed in. So make sure you give 101, 102, and 103 the same attention that you did all the others. And then the last thing is that the pass rate stays around less than 50% for the first time test takers, and it's in the 30% for repeat test takers. So for 2022, the pass, excuse me, for 2021, the pass rate for the whole year was, for, it's a 40, uh, 46%. So that's the lowest year since I've been following it. And it did fail 25,000 people. So if you didn't pass it, don't beat yourself up. Look what you're doing here today. You're doing what you have to do to pass it. And you should congratulate yourself for that. And remember what I told you before, too, before we started, if you were in here, um, even people in this office here and this brokerage where I'm at, people uh, have taken it two, three times and they're millionaires because that test has nothing to do with your career. The fact that you keep going back that proves what kind of good real estate agent you're going to be. So let's keep going. We've got five more questions. Oh, I hope you're enjoying it. It's so fun. So this one, half of you are going to have a question that is just similar to this, and the answer is going to be immediately. That's just going to be the answer. Most, as it's actually more than half, um, probably 75%. Immediately, some of you are going to have to define the word immediately. And immediately is defined by the end of the third business day, not including the day of receipt. So Monday, I knew this was going to be the bad one. Where's the good? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This check was picked up on Thursday. So the way that you define immediately, Thursday's out because Thursday's the day of receipt. And then you count three business days. One, two, three. It's going to be Tuesday. So if it was picked up on Monday, Monday's out. 
one, two, three, it would be Thursday. So um, that's how you do it. Immediately means by the end of the third business day, not including the day of receipt. Hundred percent, you're seeing this. This is so easy. What kind of rights are associated with water flowing? We love easy points because not an easy test. <laughs> Riparian rights. When when you have um, like if you walked, this isn't true, but if you walked down my backyard and there's the river flowing through my yard, I own the rights to that water, that water, that water. See, because I don't own the rights to the water that keeps going. I own the rights to the water abutting or touching my property. So anytime it says Blowing water, the answer is riparian rights. Let me check this chat, make sure I didn't lose, lose something. Ooh, compliments. Ooh, 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 we like that. No, three days, definitely not two days, three days. This is a good one. He already took the state exam. You say, oh my gosh, I had it. I had it. Okay, let's look at it. Okay, so every single person in, in, in here that's studying the state exam, you're gonna have a question where the answer is either external obsolescence or functional obsolescence, or it's gonna ask you like this. You have to know external obsolescence or functional obsolescence. So as an appraiser, an appraiser would deduct value on external obsolescence if, and, and this is the most important thing to know about external obsolescence. They're gonna deduct value, external obsolescence, if it's outside the boundaries of your property, it's bad and it can't be fixed. So if someone said to you, oh, you've got a bad root system in your yard. Okay, well, in your yard, that can't be external obsolescence. External obsolescence is a form of depreciation that an appraiser deducts value because it's outside the boundaries of your property. So listen to this. Would you rather live in a quiet cul-de-sac or a main highway? Well, of course, a quiet cul-de-sac. Because if you live on a main highway, then you're going you're gonna to lose value based on external obsolescence when the appraiser does the appraisal. So a sinkhole in the backyard, it's in your yard. It's not external obsolescence. It has to be outside the boundaries. A shopping center opening up nearby, that could add value. Oh my gosh, where I'm living right now, they're adding shopping centers and it's actually increasing values. A tree's root system front sidewalk. Nope, that's in your yard. And then now the road in front of your house became a thoroughfare or like a main highway, like cut through. Oh, your yard, your, your house just now is on a main road. Definitely that is external obsolescence. The examples on the state exam from external obsolescence uh, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, external obsolescence is um, highway, like a thoroughfare, or you live by the airport, um, or, or they use highway instead of thoroughfare. So thoroughfare, highway, airport, you see, yep, external obsolescence. If you see an appraiser deducting value based on a three-bedroom, one-bath house, that's called functional obsolescence. That's a different form of depreciation than an appraiser deducts value because it's not functional. Who wants to live in a three bedroom, one bath house? Nobody, not now. Um, the other one, there's three examples of functional obsolescence. It's the three bedroom, one bath. Um, oh, a bad floor plan. Imagine you walk into the house and you're in the kitchen and then you have to go through the bathroom to get to the bedroom. <laughs> a bad floor plan, it'd have to be pretty bad, but a bad floor plan, you will lose value based on functional obsolescence. And the third example from the state exam, is the architectural pitch of your roof is such that your electric bill is really high. Well, that's not functional. Anything that's not functional in your house, you're gonna lose value based on functional obsolescence. So everybody gets one or the other of those. Most of the time it is, it's external obsolescence anymore. Okay, let me just check this real quick again. Can't believe how many people External obsolescence also when something can't be fixed. No, if it's inside the property bounds, that would be called like um, the other one, which is like physical deterioration. It has to be outside of the boundaries. But let's look at this one. Three questions on the state exam here.
Again, I know it's kind of quick, so let's just let me show you exactly what you're going to need to know. Okay, so you're going to have three questions in my experience on the difference between the primary and the secondary mortgage market. So listen to this because this is how I explain it to my students when I'm in class. Um, we have another in-person class starting on Monday if you're anywhere near Sarasota, but probably you're already ready to take your state exam. You've already taken the course. So um, this is how I explain it to them. Imagine that it's 1905 and I want to go and get a loan from Wells Fargo to buy a house. So I'm going to go to Wells Fargo in 1905 and I'm going to buy, I'm going to say, can I borrow $5,000, let's say, to buy a house? And Wells Fargo is going to say, yeah, we, we can loan you $5,000 and you can buy a house. So that's what I do. I get the $5,000 and I buy a house. Well, you, you say, huh, that's a pretty good idea. I'm going to go to Wells Fargo and I'm going to borrow $5,000 and I'm going to buy, buy a house. Well, when you get to Wells Fargo, this is what they're going to say to you in 1905. They're going to say, or any year before, I think 1938. <laughs> so this is what they're going to say to you. They're going to say, oh, Bob, we would love to, um, we would love to make you a loan. When Michelle pays back her $5,000 in 30 years, you're the next one in line, sign here. Well, that doesn't work. You can see how the housing market was completely stalled because banks don't just have money hand over fist. Banks are businesses. They have to earn money just like I earn money and you'll earn money when you're a real estate agent. So exciting. And so banks have to earn money and how they earn money is they sell those loans. So listen to this. And I think it was 1938. You won't have to know that date. The government created this company called Fannie Mae. And they said, Fannie Mae, and just picture like a person, Fannie Mae, goes to Wells Fargo and says, hey, Wells Fargo, you know that loan that you're holding, that Michelle, that you loaned Michelle that money, we'll buy that from you. And the bank says, well, that's a genius idea. I can sell it to you, make money on the sale, still, still service it and make money every time I make my payment. And now they have a whole bunch of money. Now they can loan it to you. Well, then your friends saw this and now they want to go and do the same thing. So that's how it goes. It goes over and over and over. So the primary mortgage market, which is what it says here, the primary mortgage market, that's me, the borrower, the mortgagor, and the lender or the mortgagee. Anytime you see a borrower and a bank working together, that's the primary mortgage market. Primary mortgage market are where loans are originated. I get a loan when I go to Wells Fargo. Now, when Wells Fargo sells that loan to Fannie Mae, who is the largest contributor in the secondary mortgage market, that's the secondary mortgage market. And the secondary mortgage market, what they ask on the state exam is, what's the purpose of it? Well, the purpose is to provide liquidity or stable cash flow to the primary mortgage market because that's how banks get money. So this question says, which of the following is false concerning the primary and secondary mortgage market? So the primary mortgage market is where securities and goods are created. Yep, that's, that's right. Me and the bank, we create this loan. They make it for me. The primary mortgage market consists of lenders that originate new mortgage loans. Yep, yep, that's right. The secondary mortgage market is an investor's market that buys and sells existing mortgages. Yep, that's right. They buy it and then they, they repackage it and they sell it to the next person. It's an investor. The secondary mortgage market is it is like a silent investor's market, kind of, if you will. They don't make any loans. They buy loans and they resell them. So then D, this is the one that's false. It says the secondary mortgage market is where loans are created. You say, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Fannie Mae would never work with a borrower. That's ridiculous. Fannie Mae works with the, the lender who works with the borrower. <laughs> These two are the primary mortgage market. These two are the secondary mortgage market. Three questions. Three, it's a lot that you're gonna see on that. Last question. Boy, I hope you're I hope you're getting them all right. <coughs> so probably a lot of people put A. And that's what the state exam knows because they know what you know and psychologists write these tests and they're just messing with you. It is actually D. So listen to this. If I live in an HOA, live in an HOA, and it's an HOA that says I have to have a blue mailbox and a red fence, that is called a restrictive covenant because a restrictive covenant is something that the, sub, uh, that the um, developer 
records with the plat map that is all the restrictive covenants for the whole community. There's some crazy ones. You can't wash your car on Saturday. You can't have a house that's over 2,000 square feet. You can't park in the driveway. I mean, we could go on for days about all these restrictive covenants. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense because when you drive onto a HOA, it says this property is deed restricted. Well, they're not using the word correctly, just like we don't use the word mortgage correctly. I mean, I didn't give, I didn't get a mortgage. I gave the bank a mortgage. That's why I'm the mortgage or so, you know, but, but back to this deed restrictions are when one homeowner places a restriction got him, to the other homeowner. So if I sold you my house and I told you, you cannot build on this two stories for five years. Well, that's a deed restriction because it's from one person to the next. And so what you would know is anytime it says, what if one owner restricts, or what if I sold you, what if I sold you my house but I thought there might be oil under it. So I, I didn't sell you the mineral rights. I said, I'm, I'm keeping those. Well, if you agree to it, those are my mineral rights. That's a deed restriction because it's from me to you. But if you say you have to have a blue mailbox and a red fence, well, that's a restrictive covenant because it's for all of us or all those other weird ones. You can't have your, like your truck can't have the signs on it for your business. That's a restrictive covenant. So you're going to see that for sure. So let me show you the last slide and then we'll go through and we'll talk about um, all of your questions that you have. So here is the last slide. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I just could not even sleep last night. I couldn't believe how many people were coming and it wasn't even because the material makes me nervous is because, um, you know, just sitting in a room by yourself talking to Zoom. <laughs> if you were all in here, it would be it'd be great because we could all interact. Um, so if you would like so many more questions on the state exam and the videos with the math, all those videos, the math is so good. You can register for that cram course. It's not really a course because it's just questions and answers with videos and you kind of just take it at your own pace. And again, it has that link for even more practice tests. It's $49. Again, it's so cheap so you can afford it. You've just been nickel and dime so much since, um, since this all started. So let's go into the chat and let me see. See if it's, oh, is it not just going to give me the last 12? It's going to give me. So let me just kind of start um, looking at some questions. And it's so hot where I'm at. I wonder if it's hot where you're at. Maybe just because I'm like flustered. I want it to go good. Okay, I can't get that to go down. Come on, come on, come on. Reception is poor, your voice is going, oh, those were those days. Let's go past that. <laughs> those were those days. Those were those days, let's keep going. Oh, I see you were putting the answers, I love it. Will this be emailed to us? Yes, I'm gonna email it to everybody. Boy, I hope it's recording. <laughs> um, are you going to be recording? Yeah, just until we're finished, we'll be recording. We do the other 25 questions you have. Oh, my friend, you gotta pay for those. Then I get to do my job, and then you um you get to make the big bucks when you have a <laughs> when you have your real estate license. Um, candidate information booklet for the real estate sales associate exam. Yeah, that is just the most <laughs> important thing. Um, let's see. Oh, there's still that there. Now I'm hearing you twice. Oh Lord, that's not what you want. <laughs> oh, that looked like one. No, I don't know. Let's keep going. This thing is not you here. Maybe if I do it like this, then I can do what I want to do with it. Scroll. Let me scroll. Audio keeps cutting out. Oh, that's so bad. Um, the email. So yes, my email is Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E at Magnolia School of Real Estate.com. Michelle at Magnolia School of Real Estate.com.
Yeah, okay, the hours. Look for the biggest problems connect to the beginning of the person. Okay. Ooh, anyone interested in a study group for study? Ooh, those are awesome. <laughs> what if you're pregnant and have to pee? Oh, Lord, I don't know who you are, but we are not friends now. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, I thought that was talking about me. Like, <laughs> if you're pregnant and have to pee, I don't think there's an exception for it, but I do feel you on that. That's when you want to take it in the testing center or something like that. You say, I know I'm going to have to pee, take it in the testing center. Um, my screen is on seven and not moving forward. Ah, the people are witches. It's very stressful. I wasn't given an option. I just got the home option. That's what it looks like. You have to see that there's two blue links and it shows you in that one slide that I had. I think the, the top blue link is to take in the testing center and the bottom is to take it at home. So you'll see two, you're like a proof for two different tests, even though they're the same test. You can't even blink or move. I know, right? And it is COVID protocols, yeah um what are you buying oh yeah i thought about that example when i said it too you're not buying anything for 250,000 in california are you so lean theory you have the deed during the loan period yep that's exactly right you have the deed during the loan period and they call it the title because title is a theory like you can't find a piece of paper that's a title i would just tell you i own my house i have title you say, well, prove it. I'll show you my deed. And because I live in a lean theory state, I can show you my deed the first day I buy it, even if I have a loan on it. Um, if you don't have a calculator in the testing center that I went to in Sarasota, they have little ones for you, but they're teeny, teeny, tiny. So I would make sure to show up with a, with a calculator. I missed question 13. Yeah, definitely check that. Does a BPO have to follow use path? No. You would tell yourself the only thing that has to follow the use path, which are appraisal rules, is an actual appraisal. A BPO is a written opinion of value, and that's how they're going to ask, ask it to you. 13 is east. Oh, 13 is east. Somebody, that must have been the question Michelle. on 90 degrees. Yeah. Michelle, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but can yes. you mute some of the people that refuse to put their phones on mute? Oh, that's why the sound is breaking up. They make an all this noise. And always gotcha. The people that don't want to mute. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for telling me. Okay. Um, 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 chat. Um, do I need the Linda book if I get your courses? Um, if you want to purchase the course, that's going to be practice tests and videos. My personal experiences. There is unlimited income potential in real estate. Now, most people, 85% that start it are not in it in two years, but that 15% of those people that figure out how to find customers, which is what it's all about, that's what I'm doing today. I'm trying to find customers. If you can figure out how to find customers, you are going to make a lot of money. And if you can buy a book and take a course and study and flashcards, I would say go at it like crazy. Why should I buy a book? Oh man, it's the best book. Buy it, buy the course, study, flashcards. I mean, if it was me and I was trying to get this new career, I would do whatever it took. Now, maybe check the course because if, you're, if your test is just in a few days, then um, you're not gonna have time to wait for the book. And at this point, you may have already gone through your whole course. Like, are you really gonna read a book? So that's why the practice test and the videos, the videos are so good. You mentioned online test provides a calculator. Um, it's the actual calculator on your computer. Like if you take it at home, you have to use the calculator on your computer. Um, thank you. I'm purchasing. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Um, okay, let me see. So thank you for all. Oh, that was nice. Okay. How long is a course valid? I didn't put an expiration date on it. I actually paid more for that. So it's through a third party. You know, it's called Thinkific. It has no expiration date. And please feel free to share it with other people, um, not other schools, because I don't want them to have my good stuff. But if you know somebody that's studying for the state exam, give them your login and let them study away or print the test for them. I mean, there's yeah, definitely. Linda Crawford is on the 45th edition. We're not, we just started the 45th. So the 46th won't be till next year. I don't know why this, I can't make this like navigate this the way I want. It's like my, mainly my glasses. Where's the arrow? Oh, maybe is it right? Where are you at? I'm sorry. Technical. There it goes. Do you have practice courses? 
How long is a print with is anyone just study groups? Study groups is good. Is the online test harder than the one at the Pearson? No, the tests are the same. If you take it at home, it's the same as the testing center. Does your 63 hour course have a demo? No, my 63 hour course is from a third party. It's it's not as good. As, it, it's the same as any other course in Florida. It's not like some great, amazing course. My in-person course, that's where the pass rate's over 90% for the state exam. If you haven't taken the 63 hour course, the only reason you would take it at Magnolia versus another school is because I'm gonna email you all the practice tests so that you can study and you're gonna have my cell phone number so that you can call me anytime that you have any problems with the course. It's gonna be the support um, that you're gonna get. Chris, I have some hard questions for you before my course will expire March or some comes, I'm sure it's possible. Hold on. My course will be expiration on March, 2022 for some problems I have, so I'm not sure if it's possible to do it or just don't lose my time. So your test is, ex you're, you're expiring next month. Well, if you're already exam eligible, you need to study and take it. Call me, we'll talk, call me. Um, I, just hit? I literally can't see where to scroll. Maybe I just keep hitting that. What does the $49 include? It includes the um, 50 most asked questions, which you're gonna see like 45 of those. Not exact, some of them will be, but it's gonna be the material. Because you don't know, are you getting lane theory or title theory? Are you getting acceleration clause or you know, do on sale clause? Um, it also includes fifth most asked questions with videos, 10 most asked questions uh, for math, 25 questions, 100% on the state exam. Three, um, one of the tests is set up exactly like the state exam. So it's one question, four answers. And when you click it, it says, yes, that's right, or no, that's wrong. But it's, it's called my mega state exam is what I've titled it. And it took four years to put that one together. So it just, it comes with everything you need. Um, just on you. Uh, you mentioned. Um, no, the mutual recognition that I, I can send you a practice test. Just email me at michelle at magnoliasgoverallestate.com. And I can, for the mutual recognition, I can send you a practice test. No, you are not the only one struggling to pass. I have an entire career that I help people pass every day. Go down, go down. Why can't I see that? So frustrating. I want to be able to see where the arrow is. Oh, we're dropping people, we're dropping them. You just at the beginning of the course, you take the exam for four months. Oh, three to four months, that's so long. What is your phone number? The school phone number is 941-201-9762. Um, how much time, how do I get? So that FLRE app code is gonna come to you in an email from Pearson View once you um, are exam eligible. So once you put in your fingerprints, you wait five days and then you submit your application for your license. Once you submit your application for your license, it's gonna take four weeks to process it. That's gonna be the minimum right now. Once it's processed, you're gonna get an email from Pearson View with that number, that F-L-R-E-A-P-P -P code. That's what you need to schedule your state exam. Candidate information booklet, you just Google it. It's a PDF at myfortolicense.com and it comes right up. Okay, so I am going to, um, somebody raised a hand, that's kind of neat. I'm gonna unmute you. So if you guys wanna just talk for a minute, we have enough people on here, I think that we can kind of just talk. How do I unmute you all? I guess I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yep, you wanna just unmute yourself then we can talk. Yeah, so what is your question? Yeah, my, well, it's more of like, um, just not an opinion, but more of like an observation. Um, so I've taken the test, uh, the state exam about maybe two weeks ago. And uh, I mean, well, I fail um, with the 71, but um, what I notice is, and I, I read from, you know, I had my own course, et cetera, um, that I got from, you know, my friends and stuff. And I went through, you know, the work, went through the classes, did a 63 hours. Um, then I went through the, the booklet that, like you said, that has the percentage on what chapter is going to be on the test. And I studied that through. And what I come to find out, like taking the test is that they were the the questions so unusual that yeah. even for the most part if you kind of if you don't really know it inside and out the word plays what really gets you 
So I can absolutely tell you that everything you just said is so 100% true. If you are so 100%, 100% true. If you don't know it inside and out, the wordplay gets to you. That is why you have to make this personal decision that some people can just make inside of them that says, no matter what, I will pass this test if it's the first time or the 10th time, because there is no getting out of that wording. If you understand something like the back of your hand, it doesn't matter how they word it. I would love to go take that test just because I'm just every day. This is what I do. Whatever you do every day, you're so good at it because it wouldn't matter how they worded it. So what you got to do is you got to say, OK, what I did didn't work so far. I'm going to incorporate flashcards. I'm going to read more. I'm going to go to study groups talking about the material with people. And then listen to this too. This is what another really important thing is. You're going to want to take this test as like a professional test taker. And when you're a professional test taker, you don't look for answers. You look for what you can eliminate. So here's how you want to go about this test. When you read the question, you want to read A. And you want to ask yourself, is this true or is this false? And then when you get to B, is this true or is this false? Because when you're done, you're going to have three trues and one false or three false and one true. And whichever one is the oddball, of course, is going to be the answer. So my favorite questions say, which of the following is incorrect? Because then I now am looking for three true things. So you it want is. to... But Go ahead. I'm trying to have the portal in front of her. Go ahead. Yeah, so I would just eliminate... I now on a call, on a Zoom call for this class. Oh. So go ahead and if you're not asking a question and just mute yourself. And then when you ask it, just unmute yourself. Um, but I don't know if that really answered your question, but you, like you said, it wasn't really a question. It was more like an observation. It's like the state exam takes a regular question and then they use a thesaurus to take out all the words and then replace them with words that make it sound crazy. You can overcome that by taking a good test and knowing the material really just like the back of your hand. Hopefully the course will help you do that. The cram course, you know, if you've got Linda Crawford's book, it comes with a summary of important points after every chapter. Um, but that's what I would do. I would just recommend just telling yourself, I've got this. I'm going to study and I'm going to pass this. And if you go back two, three times, go back two, three times. Because it is literally the most amazing career with unlimited income potential as hard as you want to work for it. Um, any other questions? I hope you guys enjoyed it. Boy, I had so much fun. We had such a good turnout. And um, let's Can see. ask you a question? Yep. So I'm looking on your website. You have this prep course. Mm -hmm. How is that different from the CRAM? So the prep class is in person. So this class that's starting in this building on Monday, it runs Monday through Friday and then Monday, Tuesday. The prep class is that following Saturday. So People that are anywhere near, um, you know, Sarasota, and sometimes people come from kind of far, it's kind of a huge compliment, but we sit in this room for seven hours and do nothing but study for the state exam. And most of the time, the people that are in here are people that took the course at different schools. And, you know, they just weren't really given that kind of like passion to say, this is what's on the state exam. Let's really study it together. So that prep class is in person is the difference. Um, I had such a demand for people that lived in different places, say, do an online prep. And so that's what that cram course is. It's the okay. same course, but online. Okay, so it's the same course. Okay. What I'm also looking for is the 63-hour uh, course for my wife. And we took one course, and it's still hard to understand. The way you explain it seems very clear compared to how other ones have done it. But oh. you said your online course is not basically you doing it? No, it's not. Eventually, it will be. I've actually written the material. I just haven't submitted it yet. I'm like afraid of cats to submit it because I'm scared they're going to say no. But <laughs> so eventually, it will be me with videos giving the 63-hour pre-license. But again, the thing that makes my 63-hour pre-licensed course different if you take it online is not the presentation of the material, it's the support that you would receive. Um, again, you have my cell phone and you'll have obviously the school number, but, but it's gonna be those practice tests and things like that. You, are you guys just too far to come to Sarasota County? No, 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 actually I'm not. Uh, oh. So the 63-hour uh, course that's in, your in Sarasota, mm -hmm um that one is that how many days is that so it's seven days they always run monday through friday and then the following monday tuesday they're from 8 30 to 4 30 and the next one is mark uh february 21st in sarasota and then march 7th in sarasota and then we are march 21st in um port charlotte 
and then back to Sarasota in April and Venice in May. So that's kind oh. of the schedule there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. In class, so we have like 30, I think there's 30 students signed up for the class that's starting on Monday. Um, normally we're seeing between 30 and 40, but what I do that's so exciting and different is I track the pass rate. I know when every single person's test is, and if they need additional support, we meet outside of class. If they haven't, if they're not ready, you know, we, because how am I going to just say, hey, thanks for paying me $400, and I don't know if you ever got your license. That's why I started this school and I track it and we're over 90%. It's amazing. But if you really help someone, you know, to pass the state exam and really care, it's not hard to, to get that pass rate when you, when you actually really care. So <laughs> any other another, questions? Yeah. I do have another question. So I, I have a license from Michigan and I'm trying to get the one from Florida. Is the exam that much more different? Hold on. Do you or your spouse have any military in your background? No. Okay, one second. But it's not its not a mutual. Are, is, are you already checked it? Yeah, I did. Are you certain? Okay, so mutual recognition is going to be those seven or eight states. And then, um, oh, how do I get back here? And then reciprocity was going to be military. So for you as having a license in another state, it's the same exact process as anyone else. Right. Um, oh, here. It is. How do I, what do I, where's, oh, I know what it is. It's, it was, I was on here. Um, so it's the same exact. Yeah. But, but now that we've made sure that you actually do need the course because with reciprocity or mutual recognition, you know, you might not, but um, let's put it on that pretty blue. Um, yeah. It's the same exact. It'll be the same exact. Okay. Any other questions? We still have 72 people in. That is amazing. What a compliment that you all stayed around to listen to me ramble about this. I'm pretty obsessed with it. So hopefully you, you, um, you know, you enjoyed it. If anyone has any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. And if not, if we can go ahead. Do you know how many um, questions are on the test if you have reciprocity? If you have reciprocity, that means that you don't need to take the course or the test. So listen to this. If let's say that you called me and you lived in any state, doesn't even matter what state. So let's say Texas. And you called me and you said, hey, I have a Texas real estate license and I want to get a Florida real estate license. The first thing I asked you, just like I asked that that person was, do you have any military or your spouse? If you tell me, yes, I used to be in the service or yes, my wife used to be in the service you now qualify for reciprocity. And what that means for Florida is different than other states because what that means for Florida is all you would have to do is fill out an application and fingerprints and we're gonna give you a license. No course, no state exam. That's reciprocity. It is a benefit for veterans that have to move every three or four years. Mutual recognition, now that's gonna be different. That's for someone, and that's what I was just checking to see because I don't have them memorized. Um, reciprocity means, or excuse me, Mutual recognition means I would ask you that called me and said, you have a Texas license. I would say, oh, you have a license in another state. You may not need the course. Do you have any military? No. Okay, you don't qualify for reciprocity. Then we would check for mutual recognition and you would say Texas. And I would say, oh, sorry, Texas is not mutually recognized. But if you said Illinois or Alabama or Georgia, if you said that you had an active license in one of those states, all you would have to do is do a fingerprints, application, and a 40 question state law test, you don't need the course. So you see the only people that need the actual course are people that don't have a real estate license in another state. Um, a specific state has to be one of those seven or eight or they're exempt because they're, they're veterans or active, you know, any service. So um, um, yeah. When I email you, you're gonna be able to direct me as to the study guide for the mutual recognition. Is that what you're taking, mutual recognition? Yes. Yeah, I, well, I don't have a study guide, but I have a practice test. It's not the best. Oh. Um, I have the best practice test for the sales test and the broker's test. I have a pretty decent one I can send you. Um, I will tell you, if you get Linda Crawford's book, most of those questions are covered in the first seven chapters. Some are in, sprinkled, but most of those 40 are going to come from the first seven chapters in any book. But Linda Crawford's is just the best. But yeah, I'll, I'll send you that study guide or I'll send you that practice test. Just send me your email. Okay. And my email okay. is Michelle at Magnolia School Real Estate dot com. I already emailed. Any more questions? Okay, so I was going to kind of just go chapter by chapter and tell you stuff, but I really think, I mean, I feel like we kind of did it. It's been a couple of hours. 
Um, it was so nice spending this time with you. People are walking by and they see me kind of just talking to myself. Hopefully they see the camera and, <laughs> and realize that it's something's going on. Um, but um, yeah, if you have any questions, call me at the school. Phone's been off um, while we're doing this and I'll turn it back on. 941-201-9762. And again, if you want to purchase that cram course, you can do that right there on the website. So it was nice spending time with you guys today. I wish you the absolute best success. It's so exciting that you're starting a career in real estate. And I really, really just hope it just turns out really, really good for you. So good job on being here and just doing what you have to do to pass. So congratulations on that. Plus, I would love a quick email one day or even a call saying, you know, I passed. I love that. I, I feel that when you do that. So have a great day. Good luck to you. Bye-bye.